So good evening, everyone. Uh, and thank you for joining us today for the second student-led lecture of the semester. Uh, my name is Javier, and I'm one of the fifth year representatives of the Student Lecture Series Committee here at the Cooper Union. Uh, tonight, we're incredibly grateful to be joined by Fei Fei Zhou, a Chinese-born architect and artist. Fei received her Master's of Architecture from the Royal College of Art in London and her Bachelor's of Architecture at the University of Sheffield in the United Kingdom. Her work centers around the investigation and interrogation of man-made disturbances to the ecological environment from the movement of goods in our increasingly globalized economy. This theme is central to the work she has done as co-editor of Feral Atlas, The More Than Human Anthropocene, a project which tackles these complexities through various representational methods that speak to questions of representation, methods of disseminating information, curatorial agency, and possibilities for new tools of remediation and conversation. Furthermore, Faye's ongoing research on the Matsu, Matsutake mushroom in Shangri-La, Yunnan, China, further continues the line of research into unconventional tools of remediation as a principle for ecological preservation. Finally, I'd like to take this opportunity to once again thank Elise Jaff and Jeffrey Brown for their continued and ongoing support of the student lecture series. Please join me in welcoming Fei Fei Zhou to the Cooper Union. Thank you. Thank you, Javier, for, for the amazing introduction. I would like a copy of that, actually. That sounds really good. Um, so I guess I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, is everyone seeing the screen okay? Looks good. Okay. Um, so, um, nice to meet you all. It's, um, it's a pleasure to, to be able to, to share my work with everyone today. And I want to center this um, presentation around the theme of architecture and ecological crisis. Um, because from, you know, there's been ongoing discussion about kind of normality in our current pandemic and how um, it really taught us that normal might actually be the problem right now. And um, kind of thinking from, I got vaccinated yesterday and at the vaccine, vaccine center, it was quite interesting seeing that kids were playing and people were chit chatting and everything seems so normal at the vaccination center now. So what it really takes to make the COVID vaccine to become kind of one of those vaccines and what has it been taking for those vaccines to become the normal. Um, that just kind of triggered me to think about um, all of the phenomena happening right now and to kind of borrow the term from Adam Curtis of the hypernormalization when we know our normality is full of faults, um, especially for us architects who some of us call ourselves um, spatial petitioners problem solvers for spatial problems. So I think it's key for us to understand where the roots of all these issues and problems are coming from. So I'm going to start um, by talking about my graduation project at the Royal College of Art. Um, so this is the one drawing I submitted um, at the end of the year that combines plan sections, elevations, illustrations and animations all together. And also I see this drawing as the starting point of my career of these large scale drawings that um, explain um, complex geopolitical issues and also environmental injustice across scale chronology and locations. So everything kind of gets mixed together. Um, it's the aim of telling very big stories with very small details. Um, so my project has um, very much been inspired by Anna Singh's work, The Mushroom as the End of the World, um, which also brought us together to work on the later Ferraris projects. Um, so she said in the book that um, when Hiroshima was destroyed by an atomic bomb, it is said the first living thing to emerge from the blasted landscape was a Matsutake mushroom. So let me explain my project by telling you a story. 
The forest surrounding the Tibetan town of Shangri-La, southwest China, was intensively logged during the 1960s. Following a logging ban, these forests were left abandoned and severely damaged. The shattered ecosystem of this exploit landscape fostered the growth of the mustaki mushroom, which was one of the most valuable mushrooms in the world. Mustaki's value stemmed from the scarcity of appropriate growing conditions. The symbiotic relationship of the mustaki and their host trees is unable to be artificially replicated, um, which make the mushroom intent, um, essentially non-cultivable. So these bright yellow circles indicate the natural locations for the mustaki to grow in Yunnan province in China. Um, these mushrooms only grow in disturbed landscapes, blooming in footprints left by grazing animals or the scars left by logging activities. These dis disturbances create a unique ecology that provides ideal conditions for the growth of mustaki mushrooms and their host trees. The value of these mushrooms also encouraged commercial and social forms of exploitation. So the section here shows um, the soil composition as well as how the mycelium forms its symbiotic relationship with this host tree roots. Um, they normally fruit under a relatively thick layer of forest litter, which make them really hard to find. Um, Mustaki mushroom must be consumed within 48 hours of being harvested. So this is kind of a um, relationship between the fresh, freshness and um, the value. An enorm enormous international demand for this fungi together with the unique ecological conditions needs for growth has created an extremely complex commodity chain, which involves several stages of middlemen who exploit the local Tibetan foragers as cheap labor. The project aimed to rework the existing natural and mercantile ecologies. So on the left, um, we see kind of a process of a villager getting up really early looking for the, uh, the mushrooms, but then they have to get rid of it as soon as possible um, otherwise, they lose values. So walk along the mountain for hours, which, you, which is when the middleman were kind of sitting along the the, the way to 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 buy them buy the mushrooms off them. On the right, you see this kind of standardization of uh, mustaki mushrooms. Um, there's different rules, but this kind of um, uh, international one that has graded them into different um, grades. So the first one you see is the most valuable, but that's when the umbrella not, not opened yet, which is why they're so hard to find. Um, this drawing then kind of shows more of a, of a, a trans-regional scale of this uh, middleman working in, in the process of exploitation, which coming from the, the kind of local trading center coming to being packaged and cleaned in a factory and then to shipped abroad, mostly to Japan, which is the biggest um, consumer country of mastaki mushroom. So as a response, the design intervention begins with seven sites in or, in or around the forest of Shangri-La. The, these architectures reconfigure the existing commodity chain, but allowing the local um, mastaki workers to inhabit the forest and grade and sort the fungi and directly ship to external markets via international shipping, shipping center. Depending on the context, these um, seven sites are categorized by ecology existing within the forest, pasture or close to existing farming activities. So here you see the, the plan of one of the prototype and the forms of architecture doesn't follow any prescribed rules. It just follows the rhythm uh, of the forest or the site, meaning they can look completely different. They might look identical. It's kind of more spontaneous way of building architecture. Um, so these three animations show the design intervention on these three typologies. So in spring, um, when forests are thinning in order to allow sufficient sunlight for the pines and oaks to, to grow, um, in turn allows them, the myceliums to grow. And in summer, villagers start to build the centers using the thicker, older pines for the pole foundations and thinner ones as floorboards and facades. In autumn, when the season arrives, the, the center serves as a sorting center during the day and temporary accommodation at night. 
which in winter, when mastaki season ends, buildings are taken down or converted into other useful structures. Uh, woods will be recycled as firewood during the winter. And next it comes, it repeats. So this is the basis of a set of building proposals which attempt to align um, their metabolism with the cycle and seasonal patterns of the year. Its architecture emerges, ages, dies, and re-emerges with the trees, the masake, and its surrounding context. Um, so, from looking at the relationship between the built environment and the ecology from this previous perspective of the room, I've joined Fair Atlas pretty much straight after um, the, the project to investigate this human and non-human complexity into a higher and broader level. Fair Atlas is a digital research project on the Anthropocene through studying the non-human entanglement with human-made infrastructure projects. Um, we have a large team of transdisciplinary cross-journal collaborations, which here is a full list of every, everyone who have involved in Fair Atlas. And as someone who's from an architectural background, I worked alongside anthropologist Anna Singh, Jen Fadiga, and Alder Kellerman Saxena. And in a collective of more than 200 contributors, makers, collaborators, and volunteers. We believe that to study the intricacy of the Anthropocene, we have to listen to different voices and perspectives and approach from different angles and methods. Um, so in the Atlas, we compiled 79 firsthand situated field reports from scientists, humanists, and artists um, with artistic in interventions such as spatial diagrams, maps, video and sound clips, watercolor il illustrations, etc. Um, in ways of experimenting and even challenging the conventional ideas of mapping and to study the Anthropocene spatially from a more than human, more than human perspective. Um, Feral Atlas is the atlas of ferality. So the ferality here, or the fair effects we're talking about, indicate the undesigned, unexpected, and out of control effects, which infrastructure projects have been creating and spreading to the ecological world. And it's, it's important to notice that feral here um, comes with neither negative or positive meanings. Um, fair effects are all around us. Flora and fauna reproduce and follow their own pattern and cycles beyond human activities all the time. So examples, um, imagine an apple tree thrives after a forest visitor tosses the apple core after eating one, or on the right, the jellyfish invaded Black Sea and accidentally um, uh, caused ecological disaster after accidentally being brought by um, cargo ships in through the ballast water, which both cases explain um, this virality we're trying to talk about. So um, kind of relating back to architecture, Fair Atlas studies infrastructure projects that upset formal stable non-human cycles and rhythms and lead to ecological state changes, which caused ecological disasters. And the term infrastructure refers to human built landscape modification projects that emerge within the social and political programs, which includes plantation, deforestation, urbanization and global transportation route and many others. So for example, cargo ships, which transport thousands of tons of pathogen lead um, laced timber as commercial building materials every single day. And this kind of industrial transfer leads to the forest to be overwhelmed by insects and pathogens so intensively that they just might not recover, which is happening to us all the time. Um, so then we put these infrastructure processes in parallel um, and as a result I have created these four drawings uh, which we call them Anthropocene detonator landscapes. Um, they are kind of experiments in visualizing the Anthropocene through storytelling and also using can, kind of um, fantastical juxtapositions of landscape modification projects across time, location, and scale 
um, but with real historical references. So we use the graphics here as ways to tell horrible stories in beautiful, appealing ways to draw people's attention in details. Um, I'm, I always like to kind of make a parallel with this drawing that I always admire, which is an ancient famous Chinese painting, a scroll painting along the, the river during the Qingming Festival. Um, that kind of inspired me a lot of how to kind of create this long scroll of telling um, a multiple stories on one kind of compass. But the difference between kind of these um, anthropocene detonated landscapes with the traditional scroll painting is how can we tell um, multiple stories that kind of transcend time and location at the same time and put them all together. Um, so then each of the landscape comes with the name invasion, empire, capital, and acceleration. Um, it's, it's important to point out that they're not kind of chronologically ordered. Um, there's no kind of fixed timeline in Fair Atlas. Everything happened at some point and is still happening. They never kind of stopped. Um, and each of them was triggered by a particular historical conjunction that has led to anthropogenic environmental issues, hence the name Anthropocene detonators. So because each Anthropocene detonator gives forms um, to an aspect of the world condition, each demands to be viewed from a particular viewpoint. And I have given viewpoints two meanings here. Um, so the first one means kind of um, the perspective of viewing or drawing. Um, so plan section, AXO, two point, three point perspective, um, which is kind of chosen by the illustrator to decide, or the architects in this case. Um, another meaning is a point of view, is whose point of view we're looking at this drawing right here. Um, they invite you to place yourself into imaginary positions um, of specifically kind of socially and historically situated individuals. Um, they are human and non-humans in this case um, to kind of perceive this atlas. This, th this is why um, our collaboration with black indigenous minority artists um, particularly important here because we, we need to let them to tell their own stories in their own ways, um, especially when there's concerning imperial industrial infrastructure developments that are based on violence and exploitations. So um, uh, for, for the sake of time, I'm just going to talk in detail about two of the landscapes, um, which this one here is invasion that lies on a long horizontal axis to show the vast and almost endless expanse of unexploited landscape. So um, just imagine yourself as an explorer where your journey started from the right and continues to the left. Starting with various colonial ships, um, what you're seeing right here is Santa Maria ship that took uh, Christopher Columbus across Atlantic, Atlantic Ocean for the first time in the late 15th century. And then the British Navy ship, Navy ship in the 19th century. And the black ships, um, which is drawing the Japanese art style, is a name um, to call the Western Invaders ship in the mid 19th century. And then kind of arriving at the shore which um, causing um, various forms of violence and resistance. What we're seeing here is a human resistance and also the non-human forms, which you're seeing here is burning of the Amazon for um, cattle farming. Um, but the non-human violence is not really caused by non-human, it's just kind of the non-human forms of resistance and violence. And then progress to the European gardens, the third nature as some may call, um, as these anthropogenically modified landscapes where processes of invasion still happens to uh, till today. And to talk about invasion, we have to learn from indigenous communities perspective. Um, so what, what we are kind of sharing here is our collaboration with Aboriginal Australian artist, Nancy McDinney. And this painting of hers on invasion shows this striking scene of her great grandfather defend the land against the first wave of um, mining prospectors. This is a painting that shows colonial encounter and resistance. 
And here we have another collaboration with First Nations Canadian artist Andy Everson, um, whose drawing depicts this um, glacier that is significant for the community in British Columbia and is disappear disappearing at alarming rate um, due to climate change. So the two drawings showed um, different forms of um, destruction and violence and the record history and the present at the same time. And the second one I want to talk about is um, acceleration, which offers another, another point of view, which I kind of imagine a non-human's point of view looking up from underneath a clot of, um, a clot of marine plastic inside the ocean. So acceleration is a time that um, starting from the end of World War II when production has um, accelerated at an unprecedented rate, which includes also the production of waste and toxins. According to the UN, by 2050, there will be more plastic um, in the ocean by weight than fish. So just because we have dumped all the plastic waste to places we don't see doesn't mean they don't exist. Um, so kind of presenting from this marine life's point of view um, in this claustrophobic and contaminated environment that we have created um, is showing how it threatens your livelihood and intoxicate your bodies. So um, here we're looking at the industrial sewage and agricultural runoffs creeping into the soil of our residential blocks. And also the usage of antibiotics in piglets in pork factories that's kind of enter into our bodies through diet. And the ballast water in cargo ships accident accidentally introducing new species to other eco ecosystems and causing devastation, which is a jellyfish um, case we talked about. And of course, the dumping of um, plastic waste and the waste and pollutants produced by these infrastructure projects sweep through each other and gets mixed up, um, turning our world into a giant soup of dump. And our collab collaboration here is with um, Filipino duo Emily and Enzo Camacho of their contemporary art pieces. So that's kind of a, a collage uh, piece on acceleration here. And their artwork um, centers around this mythological figure, um, this lady here called Manalongo. She's a monster with splitted bodies and haunts the neighborhood. Um, it's kind of um, folk style in um, Southeast Asia and East Asia as well. And in Fair Atlas, Manalongo represents an intangi intangible but unstoppable force that's guiding us in this world of acceleration. She's just lingering um, on top of the industrial um, soy farm in the Philippines and overlooking at the whole world of pollution, exhaust and toxicity. And her legs are caught up in the plastic jungle. And she lingers, but she's also stuck at the same time. And just like us, there's nowhere to hide. Um, so I would like to end my presentation on kind of an open topic on architects' responsibilities in the ecological crisis. Um, to kind of just skim through three points that I think um, architecture are sometimes or most of the time a reflection of our of an error and a time. So um, I think in the time of the Anthropocene, we should talk about ecological crisis as a shared concern rather than a specialty. And also as architects, we offer a particular set of skills of noticing, representing, analyzing spatial qualities and we can do something about them. And last point is how can we design with a shifted perspective? How do we design with not just client driven but also thinking about how it affects other humans and non-humans in terms of displacement and inhabited, habitation destroyment and um, really kind of invent new ways of designing the Inthia Anthropocene from um, a more than human perspective. So I think that's all of my presentation. Thank you.
Great, thank you, Faye. And if you guys have questions, uh, you can type them in the chat or you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask directly. Oh, I, I have a question. Um, at Cooper, we talk a lot about interdisciplinarity. So I was, I was wondering about your, your experiences working with the collective at, um, at Feral Atlas. Um, yeah, that was kind of um, one of the most important, if not the most important thing I've picked up from Feral Atlas is the importance of cross-disciplinary collaborations that um, you know, in at least in the UK over here, we we have a lot of schools, you know, the AA, UCL, RCA, obviously, study ecological um, concerned kind of subjects, you know, in architecture studios. Um, whereas when I was kind of starting to um, to work on Fair Atlas, I realized how naive I was coming from, and like an architecture students' perspective, not to pick on the education system itself, but um, there's some things we just can't really, um, really kind of grasp, grasp from a designer's point of view, you know, some deep science and kind of how things work spatially across regions. Whereas we have this group, amazing group of people, the, 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 the social scientists who's actually at the site studying a topic for years, talking in the local people's languages, studying this topic and understanding the history. So I just kind of urge people to really um, collaborate with people in other disciplines. And also, you know, I talked about how we can offer, um, I'm starting kind of a new project with uh, UCSC, so um, Santa Cruz, um, of kind of making these um, spatial diagrams with them, because through the working process, we're talking to the natural scientists, um, is also a way of kind of summarizing their research topic and making these drawings is helping them to really understand their project as well. And, you know, art forms is a way to help kind of everybody to understand the topic. Sometimes words can be um, a bit too sophisticated for the mass audience to understand. So I think we as architects hosted such a variety of skills that we can really apply onto different, different, different fields and forms. Chandra, do you want to read your question? Sure. Although I think Angela was before me. I'm, I don't want to skip her, uh, which is kind of similar to what I'm asking. Okay. Angela, would you like to ask your question? Hi, thanks, Faith. It's wonderful work. I'm wondering about your techniques on the illustrations and if you can elaborate a little bit so we can learn from you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. And um, um, I can kind of elaborate from the beginning of me using kind of pen to draw for architecture projects, which was only three years ago. And so this is a way of encouraging people if you haven't drawn before, it's never too late. I've, I've started just drawing with pens rather than illustrator um, this, the first year of my master degree. And then I really got into it. And I realized actually there's benefits of not, uh, not starting to draw from the very beginning is you can use any tools because you don't really know any of them. So I have kind of quite just experiment with whatever I find I, I want to use. So I started by pen and pen um, and pencil and uh, kind of tracing from forms to just 
um, get to know the scale, get to know the figures, and then just started to kind of experimenting with Photoshop of coloring. And coloring is very important for me because I see every shade of color have some sort of meanings. So I want to be more experimental in ways that I don't want green to, to be trees and blue to be water or sky. You know, I want to kind of challenge the way we use color codes, but at the same time to kind of be quite disciplined with it because shade of color can also be misleading if we don't use right. And with Thera Atlas, it was really kind of no prescribed rules of drawing. We have just discussed and um, just get started. And I was experimenting with pen in the beginning and then I start using Wacom because it allows me to kind of jump around a big scale of um, canvas because with pen, you know, you can't really get the line weight right every time when you want to kind of pan around and zoom in and out. Um, and then eventually just is come up. So basically the beginning of the, the making of the landscape, I have no idea <laughs> what I was going to make and what tools I was going to use. And it just ended up like this. So that's kind of the process. Sanjana, you had one. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the lecture and for sharing your work. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about like, the form of the atlas and the, the way the interface works in terms of like the implications that has for knowledge creation and like, um, I guess, creating new forms of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, so firstly, the, the kind of digital humanity format was decided quite a long time ago. I guess, um, obviously the first point is Anna, Anna Singh as anthropologist, who she's, you know, a massive lover of like art forms. She's trying to like, kind of challenge the traditional ways or con conventional ways of delivering an anthropological project throughout her whole career. And then we have Jennifer Diga, who is a, um, kind of digital um, anthropologist who's studying kind of using digital ways of kind of delivering the project. Um, the, 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 the kind of basic point was just to make it open access, you know, to, to not make it into, into a book that, you know, people have to buy and have to go to a place. It's just there is available. It's for anyone to kind of come and, and, and browse around and learn something from it, hopefully. And also the interactive um, elements make it kind of a bit of a fun process to learn because with kind of deep, um, dense topics, it's easy also to lose people's attention, um, especially non-academic audience. So how do we use the form of art and graphics and you know, atlas of maps to kind of present the same topic scientifically, but also ways to kind of attract people's attention so they can kind of sit there and read through the graphics, but really kind of pick up the points we're trying to make and kind of deliver through a journey. So that's kind of um, ways what we try to make this project not facing just academics, but also for everybody hopefully even children, and also Fair Atlas one, one itself to be an educational material as well, to be used in schools, universities. Um, so then all these kind of elements come together with the benefits of digital humanity. And, you know, we have kind of challenged the maps as well, I think, especially for architects. Um, I don't know how you guys feel if you have being on Fair Atlas and looking at what we call the flow maps, we have this huge debate in the beginning of the project um, that we, some of some of the team members don't think that's a map and we try to convince them that this is a map. So these kind of discussions um, burst out through the creating of a site. You know, we have to work together um, with the coders, with um, the designers and with the scientists and with, you know, the humanists to create these kind of graphical elements 
And that is in the process, we're agreeing on something, which is when we are kind of learning from each other. And that is, I think, a, a, a great valuable point of kind of working on something digital, um, on digital humanity form, which force us to come together as well. Thank you. Uh, Katie, would you like to uh, ask your question? Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I guess I'm, I'm wondering about the, the impact that you see yourself and, and artists like you having um, in terms of climate change. Uh, I guess, can you speak a little bit about the audience that you have actually reached? Do you think you've changed anybody's mind? Kind of what you, what you see the, the impact of this movement being? Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to change my family's mind to start with. Um, I, I spent two years um, well, the two years I was in the making process of Fair Atlas, I lived in Copenhagen in Denmark, and they have this amazing way of recycling everything. And then um, I went back to, to London, and now I'm in China. I see ways of people kind of don't really recycle the same way as how, um, you know, people were doing in Copenhagen. And it really started to kind of sadden me from that point because I was drawing this plastic on acceleration and drawn and drawn and drawn. I just thought, this is so fucked up, <laughs> what we're doing. And then I start to get really kind of guilty every time if I use a plastic kind of packaging for takeaway. And then I remember, and I was saying, the point of acceleration is to kind of make you think about how easy the world have made us to create it, to create these plastics. You know, every time we're out and, you know, we're hot, it's so easy to go buy a plastic bottle. And what you do, you toss it out after you're drinking it. And now it has made me kind of link my behavior with what she said, because it is so easy for us to kind of um, do things that kind of disobey what we want in, in this kind of critical time of climate change. Um, so it's kind of really bearing into the, the, the tiny point. And I see your, your question of, do I see myself as an activist? I, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm very wary of putting titles onto myself because I think any title requires really strict and extreme disciplines to yourself to, to follow what the burden that the title brings from. I, you know, I see loads of people at that time in London going to kind of protests of the Extinction Rebellion. But I kind of wish people would like, that is great. You know, that is amazing. But at the same time, I wish people can pay more attention into tiny things that I may not necessarily consider as, as kind of big achievement, which is turn the light off when you leave the room and, you know, turn the tap off when, when you don't use the water, cut down your plastic. And all these tiny things are actually the tiny elements in the drawings of Fair Atlas. And every element matters. Um, so I think that has really kind of made me become this person of going around like, please turn the tap off. You know, sometimes I'm like this annoying friend, but through kind of working on the details, you really put yourself, have some, some sort of like hyper attention into details. And I think if, more people can can do that. That is a big change. Um, so yeah, thanks for your question. And thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts with everyone. Nancy. Hi, Fei Fei. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, my question, I guess I'm interested um, I think it's great like that um, we can raise awareness, but I was wondering like as architects or designers, if there's anything tangible or, um, you know, uh, in a kind of built way that you might have any advice for, um, such as like, I'm not sure if there's such thing as architecture for the Anthropocene, but maybe it's quite a new field, but I'm just really interested, like what does this kind of architecture might look like or 
if there's any people already doing work in this field that you know of, who you might um, think are inspiring that you can tell us about. Yeah, thanks for the question. Is is um, it, it has been a con continuous um, thought and struggle of mine actually, of working on something kind of more of a, in a research direction rather than a practitioner or practical um, aspect. I think the struggle from my perspective is what Fair Atlas studies is something that's such on such a vast scale, you know, it's infrastructure and the infrastructure is kind of ubiquitous, is like everywhere on earth, like in, in this world. And there's something bound to be down because we, you know, we as architects, we, we, we build infrastructure sometimes. And this is like kind of a core of challenging the system of building these infrastructures as kind of creating all these feral effects are creating essentially catastrophes in the world. Um, I have been kind of in contact with architects who are answering your previous question. There is a topic of architecture in the Anthropocene. I think that's kind of a quite a popular, a hot topic now in the UK at least, or in Europe. Um, so the architects I know of um, who are in the field and working kind of um, greatly towards the topic um, is firstly my tutors, um, they're called cooking sections. They are um, a duo of uh, spatial petitioners. They work a lot towards the topic. They, they are the, the people who inspire me basically into all these kind of ecological concerns topics. Um, one project that um, I thought was really great to mention is the project called Clivemore, which is um, in um, Isle of Skye in Scotland, <clears throat> which they, they research into salmon farming of how kind of um, incorrect ways of uh, f f salmon farming has kind of exposed the salmon into kind of danger of exposed to light, uh, salmon lice, but also kind of ways of um, inhumanity of, um, you know, into kind of local agriculture. So then they discovered using mussels as a replacement of salmon because mussels actually filter pollution in the seawater, which I've done another project on how mussels actually contain, con are contaminated when consuming them, but that's a different topic. Um, so what ha they have created is this kind of really interesting, um, it's almost like an art project in the spatial form, is uh, something more like a seat and a table that um, is exposed as a structure when it's low tide. And in high tide, when the water hits, there's kind of nets underneath that captures the, the, the oyster and then mussels and, and oysters. And when the, when the water kind of um, disappears, you get to sit there and dine as a performance art. But at the same time is, is using this very kind of witty ways of um, really kind of telling an environmental concern story and presenting a solution at the same time. Another architect I was very inspired by is um, Andrea Hacker, um, Office of what's the of Office of Political Architecture, I think, um, or disciplines, um, who um, have done a lot of um, research also on mining and very kind of uh, close the door on the back um, research projects on kind of you know other communities. So one of the projects I've uh, listened to by his was. Um, on you know this kind of tinted glass in New York of um, high-rise buildings as a way of picturing the perfect New York uh, millionaire life of this you know view towards the Central Park, and to make this kind of slight tint color involves mining into kind of um, other communities sometimes um, in Latin America of um, mining this kind of rare elements as you know damaged the the livelihood polluted the water and everything that's kind of like the, the different forms of violence that's behind the doors of this kind of perfect picturesque life and that's kind of another way of what architects can do is kind of link these spatial um issues together 
by kind of studying something that's that's just so you know so simple and so normal um so yeah and there's another um group I think in Russia they were studying something more on the infrastructure scale which I've heard of but haven't really got into so I know there are people who are trying to work towards a field which um it will be it will be really encouraging to see if more people join force because then when there's kind of a, a scale of a of a of collective of people and architects um we can maybe form something to study something that's quite like into into a into a global scale um infrastructure per se um the next question is from hugo who doesn't have a microphone but um they say why is it more effective to see illustrations of climate catastrophe as opposed to just photographs or text? And thanks for showing your work. Sorry, could you repeat the question, please? Yeah. Uh, why is it more effective to see illustrations of climate catastrophe as opposed to photographs or just text? Mm. Um. I don't think illustrations necessarily are more useful than text and photographs. And um, I think the point of Fair Atlas in a way is we use different um, forms of media to kind of represent different, different topics. So um, these illustrations are kind of one aspect, which is the kind of ways of putting infrastructure processes in parallel to make an argument. And then in the next step, we are talking about what we call the tippers, which, which is the infrastructure mediated state change, which is essentially talking about the actions, what infrastructures have done essentially. And then we realize maybe other forms are not, not enough to represent the actions. So we start using moving image and audio sound. So then that works much better than just a diagrammatic or something kind of, kind of more 2D and um, visual in a form that's kind of on the on the plane on the plane canvas, and then moving on to kind of um, the field reports. Then we use text because text. But then in the way text is not kind of academic paper format. It's more uh, a, a observation. Is we don't limit this kind of ways of writing. People can write in any format, and so kind of using different. Um, medium and genre to just represent different topics that just to find out what what the best form is to represent topic um so yeah we also have photographs actually and i was working recently because we need to submit uh, materials for a prize and then i was looking at this case called genja um which is um this kind of plant in um um, Southeast Asia that later became this weapon of propaganda during the war um, in Vietnam. And then the flow map, which is a map we call in um, Fair Atlas, is a simple photograph of the author's, um, I believe, grandmother holding a photo. Um, and that was just so powerful because that was there's some something so simple coming from a powerful photograph that, you know, complexity in the illustration might not achieve or text might not achieve. So um, yeah, I think every tool and every medium is powerful on its own. Carolee, if you'd like to ask your question. Um, hey, good night, Faye. Thank you so much for your um, presentation and Thanks for sharing your process with us. So I was wondering what are your inspiration to draw the maps? Um, I mean, after I placed my question, you mentioned some architects, but I was wondering if you can mention some artists or artistic movements or graphic designers and such. Mm -hmm. Okay, artistic references. Um, to be honest with you, I haven't really looked at many references creating my 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 drawings. 
I think that's why um, I was saying that I have no idea what it will look like at the end. Um, well, the, the kind of ways of putting things together was definitely something I picked up from the studio I was at by cooking sections, that they have encouraged people to, to have one big draw and go bigger. So um, when I was in my second year in master degree with cooking sections, um, my drawing was the smallest and it was 2.5 meter long <laughs> in the studio. So I think that was a good exercise and, and I encourage people to do it actually, to kind of just try to put everything together and then you start to form a narrative of your own project. Um, because from my personal perspective is we get to kind of lost in um, writing briefs and then it's really hard to pick up what we really want to, to design in our brief and ways of putting things together give you kind of perspective and priority and hierarchy even of like what you really want to pick up. Um, if talking about drawing references, I have looked at a lot of um, CJ Lim's unit in the Butler. Um, they produce these amazing drawings. Um, what I do want to say from the unit is just too much a bit of a replica um, that um, I tend to not have too much in my drawings um, because I kind of want to use every bit of my canvas to tell different stories. So too much replication kind of, um, I feel, stopped me from doing that. Um, I can think of more um, if, if, um, if you're interested in, in the later conversations. Um, but yeah, I haven't really looked at many, many other references. Um, Julius, if you want to ask your question. Hi, Fei uh, Fei. Thank you for presenting. Um, forgive me if you already mentioned this, but I came in late and I was wondering if you could elaborate on how you took the information given to you by the researchers you worked with um, and designed like the space, the end space for the users. In the forest, mm. I, I missed mm. part of it. Sorry. Yeah, thanks. Um, I don't think I've talked about it previously. Um, it was interesting that um, working with um, the Feralis team is quite a challenge for designers. And um, I think other designers from different disciplines will kind of have a stronger answer as well, because it's academic project with very fast progress, but very kind of delayed deadlines, um, which we call it academic deadlines, meaning no deadlines. Um, so the first time I met with, with Anna and Jennifer, it was, it was a bit of a process of Anna telling me an extremely complex story and say, can you draw something in five minutes? Um, so that kind of really fast um, process was kind of got me on my nerves and my first instinct is just to sketch. And then I started to collage with the elements I found from the internet, which we found this way very useful. Um, so it's more of a ways of us discussing um, what, what kind of we want to, to present on this drawing, which you see, say invasion, you know, there's, there's um, we want to represent something about the, the invasion from the 1980s, I'm sorry, 1680s and then coming to form some sort of human violence. So then that's kind of, it, it just very naturally occurred that, okay, I wanna create something very long and horizontal because it sounds like it's more of a journey in a linear way and time become very important and to draw the ships coming out of the shore. So what kind of ships do I wanna represent? So that's kind of more a conversational process of um, constantly bouncing around ideas. And one thing that's very important and I think is it could be very important for everybody sitting here is when you draw, um, make sure the accuracy and sensitivity of your drawing. So I remember in one of the drawing called Empire at the bottom, there's kind of the mixture of teak and cassava plantation that's kind of representing this kind of cross plantational um, scene in Southeast Asia during the colonial time. And Anna said, there's a, there's a teak and a cassava. It took me about month 
to really find out what that particular ways of plantation look like because there was kind of no historical photographs we can find and it's described through kind of ideas and memories and empirical research and but the point is we can't we rather not draw this than draw something that's inaccurate so that was kind of something really important to pick up from the scientists and working with them is accuracy and also the sensitivity of you know, I used to kind of just draw people. You can see from my, my previous project, I just draw people on it. And working on Ferro Atlas, I realized, um, you know, drawing human figures, especially from other communities, sometimes come with this um, stereotyping. Now, we, we ourselves don't, don't want to impose, but they just get imposed from graphics. So there's a way of what you can draw or you can't draw. And this is all working, you know, with, you know, Jennifer Deagle, who's studying an Aboriginal culture without having this really dense conversation with her. I wouldn't know that I was making a mistake of drawing other figures. So, um, yeah, I hope that answered your question. Um, Angela, if you'd like to ask your question. Hello, Faye. Uh, out of curiosity, and because I admire you, uh, could you tell us a bit more about what your next steps will be? Are you thinking of keeping your research or are you planning, do you see yourself as an architect who builds? Because mm -hmm. it, in, my, in my point of view, I'm, I find it very contradictory with the with all the ecological studies and and for me it's a struggle so I want to know your opinion thank you yeah thanks um yeah my next steps um I'm kind of on the pause right now um you know due to other reasons but at the same time I think I'm giving myself time to really contemplate on what the next steps are um I wouldn't stop research uh researching in, in you know, this field, I think I would always be researching and go deeper and go kind of broader and go more specific. Um, but then, yes, I really want to step into the, the building process because also it's a struggle. You know, we, we as architects, we, we study in studios to design stuff, to come up with design interventions and to constantly be researching these topics, not being able to come up with a design intervention is, is is, is really kind of strong struggle for me as a designer. And so, yeah, I've talked about kind of um, concerns about working on something that's on such a large scale, but I think maybe I should start small and start something quite local and regional um, through how I'm not quite sure yet. It could be through teaching, for instance, and also through kind of working with local communities um, by picking the site and the base. Um, which is why I was, you know, after I stayed in Copenhagen for two years, I was really keen to go back to London because at the moment there is this thriving scene of kind of um, really doing something um, about kind of the ecology in architecture, particularly in London. And, and most people start to kind of work towards a very specifically, um, you know, geologically located um, region of very specific research project. So I think that is my next step to find is coming from more of a um, regionalized um, point of view and start to design from there. Uh, Daniel, do you want to share your comment slash question? I guess it's not really a question, um, but I can read, you know, I, uh, congratulations on this, this project is quite, quite an undertaking. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Good. Uh, so I've actually been in a, a seminar or two with Sven Beckert on the, the history of, you know, the, of global capitalism and I admire him quite a bit. Uh, so I read his essay just now. 
um, and that helped me to understand um, sort of the, the import of a feral atlas. So I just wanted to uh, express my admiration for the the importance and the um, and the impact. Uh, and I think the fact that it's a little at perplexing at first uh, makes it more enticing in a way. Uh, it kind of draws you in, at least it did for me. Maybe some people might look at it and be put off by it a little bit, like wondering what is this? Um, but of course, the more time you put into it, the more um, you get out of it. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. The luminary essays, what we call them, are like the 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 golden points of Fair Atlas. Um, the, the editors have spent a lot of effort inviting people um, with kind of high academic um, credit to to really write these essays to explain, um, you know, the the categorization say about um, anthropocene detonators, um, very kind of specifically and um yeah i'm really glad you enjoy the essays we 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 went through a very long process of how to design the journey to kind of not make people so lost um i will and i would like to hear more like feedback from everyone you know do you do you feel lost browsing through fair atlas what what was your first kind of thing to read um and it's all kind of experimentation into designing the the website. But yeah, thanks for your comment. Uh, Brighton. Yeah, um, I've, I've been thinking a lot about like, like learning and like the delivery of information. So I was really curious about when, when you showed the clip of the, the Atlas, you talked about um, looking at mapping in space from a non like a non human perspective. Mm -hmm. so I'm kind of curious about um, like the steps you got, you, you took to get to there and what type of research you did? Mm -hmm. um, I was set, normally when I start doing something, Feralis is kind of a different um, story because firstly it's very kind of broad. Um, so that was kind of created in a different format. But if I'm starting a new project, I will firstly establish a, um, kind of a main character, which most of cases are non-human or, um, and then I will kind of coming from the second character or kind of a, um, a deputy character, however you call it, which will become, um, which will be kind of a human character, but from a more um, unrecognized or unheard point of view. So I was kind of um, working on this project with, um, anthropologist Kirsten Keller on um, growing mussels in Southeast Asia in um, um, Jakarta Bay. And her project was so complex, you know, into studying the history of water, uh, is, um, colonial infrastructure projects on kind of usage of water, environmental injustice, our kind of rich development having impact on the urban poor and fishermen. And we were kind of working around for so long and um, it was really hard to kind of start a drawing from there. So it helps me to pick up a non-human character, which isn't green muscle and start from looking different scales. I start looking at bacterial kind of, which is microscopic scale and make that really big. You know, my, my kind of method is make small things really big and big things really small because you've seen the big things everywhere, you know? So you don't, we don't really have to like draw it again for small things like, you know, bacteria, fungi, or heavy metal these are things that you don't see so blow it up <laughs> in the drawing and take up your attention and then draw the people you know the villagers they are they're kind of you know they're the kind of at the bottom of this chain of environmental injustice because you know people think they are the ones creating the urban urban sewage and stuff so let's make a big diagram firstly about them and then about how the urban sewage and pollution is actually from the, uh, the kind of more luxury de development of the city. So make these connections really clear. And then it flows quite naturally of how can you can connect with different geological points and different stories and people and time. Um, so yeah, that was kind of my, my bit of experience. Uh, 
Um, another question from Hugo, which um, says, what does salvaging the forest mean? Salvaging forest in quotations slash how did you decide on this title? Um, I was thinking of the title of um, salvation, salvage the forest by savaging it. And savage again comes with quite a negative term, but I want to kind of using the negativity in the term to kind of um, as a way of reconsider the, the relationship between um, human and forest. So, um, you know, the whole thing about, you know, Anna's book and also the point that has kind of really inspired my project is um, people talk about nature and um, obviously urbanization has made us think about nature as this like kind of perfect forest or a bit of a park like the Hyde Park in London and Central Park in in New York and that was like the, the picturesque perfect nature and comparing one tree you know in in Cent Central Park to one tree in the Amazon and the value has completely kind of vary but what has really like mean about nature that human has really kind of disturbed the nature since our very existence you know we cut trees we hunt we step on the forest floor um so then like the crit there's a criticism on you know human disturbing the nature or kind of doing activities in the nature whereas i think it's more about finding the relationship of what kind of interactions we can really have because we're bound to have interactions we can't just leave the forest alone um so I guess using the word savage was um, a term I would like to kind of bring up some sort of sparks in discussion of sometimes in the negativity, which, which bursts into more of a, of a question of like, what does it really mean? Which is kind of similar, similar concept with the feral that has triggered a lot of kind of quite intense discussions with people from dis different disciplines of giving different meanings to the feral, but to us, it just means out of human control. Uh, Sanjana? Um, yeah, just based on what you answered for the previous question, I'm curious if the work of Emma Maris played into your thinking about feral and like words like savage and salvage. I'm not familiar with Emma Maris' work. Yeah. Javier, I was, um, can I say, can I ask my qu uh, question? Of course. Uh, uh, so in your response, in one of your responses, you, there was this moment in which you, you mentioned that you would, you were thinking, of, you're thinking about these problems and then there's this desire to design something to re resolve it um, or resolve some of these things. Um, and I think a lot of designers <laughs> kind of feel that way, but I'm wondering if, if, um, if in your, in your projects and in what you've learned from other researchers and even, um, people who you've come in contact with through these projects, if, if, um, not designing is also a solution in ways in which, um, not designing an object, but designing, say, a relation might be the way to go. Mm -hmm. And this is the second part of kind of, I guess, because you said you you would welcome feedback. And, and in a way, I want to learn more about this. But looking at the website, I'm just really, really inspired by it after reading also um, Anna Singh's book um, and thinking about how you guys are creating a certain, an inter, not, not just an interdisciplinary um, relation between, um, between, you know, practitioners, but, you know, you're also embodying, like your practice, you're embodying a way to do things that is not designing an object, but designing a way of doing things. And, and, and I'm thinking if there is another step here, because right now the website is so, in a way it represents the project that's almost concluded and it represents the institution that you know published it stanford but i wonder if it could grow beyond that or i wonder what your plans are to grow beyond that to become more of a 
a directory for, for students and practitioners to connect with each other and continue this project and grow into kind of a movement. Um, so if you could talk about uh, your ambitions in, in that way in designing this other way of mm -hmm. working. Yeah, thanks, thanks for, for the question. And I think what you said was really right about not necessarily designing objects rather than designing relationships. Um, because, you know, we know by now that when we design something it comes with this undesigned effects, right? This is the whole point of infrastructures is when it was creating um, for effects like pollution or, um, you know, landscape simplification that comes with monoculture, but then kind of the the killing of biodiversity. It was it was not the intention of designing an infrastructure, and it still happened, and it still have this long term effects from even historical establishment, and and the long term effects can last for like a thousand years, in like nuclear I don't know, um, leak and stuff like that. So, but then it's very hard to think about that because once we have designed architecture, which formed a kind of relationship with nature and ecology already and dismantled that would create another relationship. So every step kind of means something and comes with effect. And I do, I do think what you said about kind of just not designing anything was something that is really worth pursuing, but undesigning not, doesn't mean kind of don't do anything like no action per se is more something more like almost like staying like you're on the treadmill you're trying to do something to kind of stay in the balance because I've, I've been kind of reading a lot of kind of interpreting interpreting the world through different ways um there's kind of a western linear way or eastern kind of circ um in a circular motion, which I kind of see that as a very deep philosophy for designers as well, because I feel like, um, like I said, architecture sometimes a reflection of error. Um, you know, when I was kind of looking at Archizoom and Archigram of this kind of uh, vision of this hyper kind of modules, that was a reflection of post-war, you know, people were thinking there was gonna be a population boom and architecture reflect on that. Um, whereas right now I feel like what um, what we could do is invest in this balance and accept that things could come back to, to origin and things can just allow to not move forward and to give up maybe the fact sometimes that we don't have to progress a lot. And that requires effort actually to keep ourselves into a stabilized um, state which is what kind of the nature was keeping balance for a long time until you know acceleration really hits and broke that balance and i think it requires so much more effort than before because we are in a digital era and we are in this kind of time of crazy digitalization of um, fast technology and how to kind of come up with a system to even kind of co or kind of counterbalance that was something I think that would be really interesting to explore. So I think that was a common shared of question that I don't really have a clear answer to that, but I would really like to, I'm very inspired and I really like to kind of pursue a bit more onto that. And yet Feralis is not kind of aiming to be a project that just stops right now. Um, but what other thing I think we want to do is every project um, can get spread and inspire people. And that was also the aim of Fair Atlas is when you kind of view it and, you know, there was a, a set insight to take Fair Atlas as a verb, meaning that once you've kind of looked at the, the, the project, hopefully you get to view the world through a quite different lens now, because these kind of things you see that surround you um, as kind of mundane everyday activities suddenly have a different meaning and can act differently to, to everybody who sees a kind of plurality coming behind it. And that was something I think that could, quite, that could be quite um, important for people to take on. And 
discover the, the fur effects around you. Um, so yeah, and I hope that can kind of, the kind of effects can never stop from effects as, as in the fur atlas um, effects on people. Thank you. Um, anyone else have any questions, comments, or thoughts? There are, aren't any. Um, I'd like to thank Faye for joining us. Uh, this is super great. And um, all of our audience for joining us this evening. And we will hopefully see you next time. So have a good weekend, everyone, and a good evening, and see you soon. Thank, yeah, you. thank you, everyone. See you thank soon. You.